the example from Star Trek, which is the Borg. You take a robot, you take a human, you put it together, and you're forming something totally unique, which is the Borg. But within the Isse community, they did some, or excuse me, let me give you an example from the Isse community. An example is, behind me, a Buddhist church. The Isse brought with them their religion, which is Buddhism. They, did, they came to the United States, and they saw their Christian neighbors in a church on Sunday morning. And so they created something uniquely American, which is a Buddhist service on Sunday mornings, every Sunday morning, which is really unique. That's assimilation. That's the legacy of Nisei. Act two is the Nisei. The Nisei are the second generation Japanese Americans, the first generation born in the United States, but most importantly, they're the generation that was the first American citizens on the, in the United States. Unlike their parents, they were stuck between two worlds and two questions. One was, are they Japanese like their parents? Or are they American the way they felt? Because they've never been anywhere else. But it, as Americans in baseball, right? I apologize if I'm standing in your way. Um, so, but unfortunately, most people saw them as Japanese. So here are some pictures of the way people saw them. But unfortunately, most of the Nisei, they felt American. And they had to express that. Then Pearl Harbor happens. Everybody knows Pearl Harbor, right? I hope. Okay. It's like 9 11, except seven years ago. Um, <laughs> when Pearl Harbor happened, everybody hated the Japanese, the uh, Japanese Americans, excuse me. So they were sent to camps, 10 remote camps, in an uh, average of three years. There are 120,000 of them. The average of these camps, uh, people stayed about three years in these camps. Now, a lot of them wanted to prove their Americanness, so they fought for the United States in Europe and in the Pacific. But a lot of them were so upset about what happened, they decided they wanted to go back home. Now, the, the legacy of the Nisei is that all of this camp experience, people decided that they felt like it was their fault. That everything that happened to them was their fault. They said, had I not been Japanese, had I acted more American, had I not spoken Japanese, none of this would have happened. So from that point on, the, our, our community was, just, was destroyed. We stopped speaking Japanese. We stopped celebrating Japanese culture, Japanese anything. We wanted to be American. So it brings us to Act 3. Act 3 is the sunset. And the Sansei are third generation, and like their parents, they didn't want to be American at all, or excuse me, they didn't want to be Japanese at all. They wanted to be as far away from, uh, from Japanese as possible. So what, what they fought for was equality in the United States. So here are some pictures of people fighting for equality in the United States. But their most important legacy was in 1988, the Civil Liberties Act, which gave $20,000 and an official apology to every Japanese American who was in the camp. And, um, but most importantly, what it did was it said it wasn't our fault what happened during World War II. That it was because of racism and fear, but not because of, uh, because that we were Japanese. So now, Act 4, the Yonsei, this, this is, the Yonsei is my generation, and we're a very diverse group. There are a lot of Hapas, there are a lot of people of mixed ancestry, there's a lot of people doing lots of different things. Do you guys know this guy? Mike Shinoda, he's uh, from Lincoln Park. He's my hero. So, <laughs> so I'm going to tell, I'm going to tell the, the story of the Yonsei in, in three different trends. There's three different trends of the Yonsei through my writing. I'm a, I'm a filmmaker, by the way, um, and I work at the Japanese American National Museum. So the first, the first trend is this movie. This is my first movie. It's called Haunted Highway. And the trend is that they want to continue to be American, that we don't want to be Japanese, that we just want to prove our Americanness. And even a few generations later, a lot of Japanese Americans are still proving that. Um, the second trend is the idea of a post-ethnic identity. Post-ethnic identity basically means that there are no more distinctions between Chinese and Korean and, and, uh, and, and Japanese and Vietnamese and Filipino, that we're all under this one banner called Asian American. And so you're finding a lot more uh, young, younger kids ex expressing that they're Asian American, not Japanese American or Chinese American. So this is an example from my, this is my newest movie called The People I Slept With. It's a romantic comedy, it's not porn. Um, <laughs> And it's not about the people I slept with, by the way. <laughs> but uh, this is an Asian American movie. And I was going to show you a film, but I don't think there's enough time, so I'll go ahead. Go ahead. The third trend, and I think the most important trend, so let's. Oh, do you want to show the. Oh, it's not working, it's fine. Um, third, <laughs> if you want to see it, I'll show you. I actually have the DVD at my hotel room. Oh, you have to come to my hotel room, though. <laughs> All right, the third trend, I think the most important trend of this conversation 
is uh, the idea that a lot of Japanese American, Gonsei, the fourth generation, are starting to reconnect with Japan. It's been two generations since the war. We went through the whole apology, we went through all of that. So now a lot more Yonsei are deciding that they want to re they want to reconnect with with their cultural heritage. So you're finding more and more of us going to the JET, which is the teacher study uh, teacher exchange, right? They also doing, they're going to Japanese school. They're also going to visit Japan. Before, if you talk to a Nisei or Sansei, they would never even want to go to Japan. They had an aversion to Japan. But now you're finding Yonsei that actually want to go. So things like Yonsei basketball, every summer Yonsei kids come to Japan to play basketball. And I think they kick the crap out of them, but that's just me. Um, a, lot of, a lot of Yonsei also, they, they go to cultural uh, museums or uh, centers to learn more about the Japanese culture. I work at the Japanese American National Museum. That's why I need to put it up there. Um, but for myself, in my writing, I, before, before recently, I never wanted to write a Japanese project because I always felt like I'm American. I only write Asian American or American projects. But recently, I've started finding that I'm much more qualified. Oh, I'm not much more. I'm, I'm qualified to write a Japanese movies as well. So I'm writing a story about Isamu Noguchi. Everyone knows Isamu Noguchi, right? I hope. He's an artist. Um, this other story I'm writing is about Sugihara. He was a diplomat. And the third story, and the most, the most interesting story, I think, to this conversation, again, is I'm writing a Madame Butterfly. And this is, this is a very interesting film because everyone knows Madame Butterfly, the opera is racist and all that, that stuff. So I'm taking a look at it from a non-racist point of view, and I'm working with a Japanese writer who's writing it from a female Japanese point of view. So it's, it's a very highly collaborative process. And the reason I'm involved in the Madame Butterfly is not only my Japanese American, but I also can write for an American audience. And that's, that's why I agree with the project. Now, what is the future of the Japanese American community? I think it's more collaboration. When you get the Gosei community, you're gonna find that we're working, they're gonna start working more and more with Japan. They're gonna, they're gonna start learning about Japan again, and they're gonna start being a part of Japan again. And this is all stems from what happened after World War II.